It is day 12 of this invasion, and for anyone who didn't join us last week, we were speaking to you on Friday. It struck me that we should start our conversation today. As you've watched things, what has changed since Friday, and what would you say as we begin this week is the situation on the ground? Well, what has changed? Uh, the, um, there's, the bombardments are becoming more intense. We're seeing more Russian Air, uh, air Force in the air dropping bombs. The, um, the encirclement of Kyiv is almost complete. Uh, both columns on the west and east side of the river uh, probably are almost looking at each other right now. That long convoy uh, is uh, steaming towards, uh, towards the uh, city. And I think it's uh, loaded with artillery ammunition to, con to continue the, um, the bombardment. Uh, the Russians seem to be in good shape. Uh, the um, Ukrainians are preparing. The crowds outside the recruiting posts, uh, registration posts are large. Refugees continue. And I think it's going to be, this week is going to be uh, uh, long and bloody. The uh, bombardment, as I said before, will become more intense, even though diplomacy continues. And we're right now at 1.7 million Ukrainians have, fled the, have flown the country. Yes. Uh, and that will, that will continue as well. So I don't see any, uh, any uh, new developments, but certainly a more intense, uh, an intense bombardment around the cities. And of course, uh, once Odessa falls, the entire south of the country will be sealed off. So the Russian intent to, uh, to isolate the Ukraine is working. Uh, and um, we shall see. I wish I could look into the future and tell you, but I can't. Well, let's try to do that a little bit. What I would like you to help me do is look inside conference rooms. It struck me when we spoke on Friday that as a former NATO war planner, when you were based in Heidelberg, Germany, what is going on right now in the face of what you say, likely to be long and bloody and very difficult conflict to come? What are the things that they are planning right now? What are the scenarios that they will be trying to envisage and to plan for uh, in NATO offices and in Europe right now? Well, as I said last week, the, uh, the, the, the lines between uh, NATO headquarters and uh, and the members of the alliance are probably burning uh, all day on all night, uh, wor working up plans to reinforce, with, uh, not reinforce, but to send more more equipment uh, uh, and better, maybe better, heavier equipment to the Ukraine. That's probably being developed. There's an initiative to put uh, uh, alliance planes via Poland into the air. Uh, I don't put much confidence in that. They'll be blown out of the air by the Russian Air Force as soon as they appear. And um, it's also a very, very, a very, very dicey move that uh, could, in fact, escalate and, and, and cause even more difficulties. Sorry, let me the just jump in on that because maybe people aren't following that. That has really been the push in light of the fact that there is no move for NATO to declare a no-fly zone, which you support, I know. What the latest thing that we're hearing, and uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is now stressing, is trying to get U.S. F-16 fighter planes into Poland to backfill so that they can then send MiG jets and Sukhoi jets, Soviet-style jets, into Ukraine so Ukrainian pilots can fly those. And uh, you're suggesting that you think there are, this is really what they're, I think one of the things they'll be talking about keenly today, you think there's a lot of risk attached to that plan. I think I think there's a tremendous amount of risk because, of course, you don't know how Putin and uh, and his his entourage, his political entourage, will react to that kind of escalation. And that's what it is: it's escalation. Um, that is a good or a bad idea. I, I'm not prepared to say, but uh, you can imagine the alliance's position here. Here, the alliance cannot, for all kinds of good reasons, uh, establish. Uh, Establish alliance airspace over Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, with a no-fly zone. So they've got to do something, and they've uh, reacted with this um, with this plan to, uh, to to reinforce the uh, Ukrainian air force. I don't put much hope to it. Uh, um, it. It's it's simply something that can go terribly terribly wrong. All all of our good intentions aside. So the planning that is going on, as you said, lines burning up. I'm just wondering, there was the attack on the nuclear power plant when last we spoke on Friday. Over the weekend, we have just seen excruciating video of families carrying their, you know, mourning over dead children, of attacks directly on families trying to flee those humanitarian corridors, it, huge and heavy bombardment of civilian areas.
How might those instances, those visuals, those kinds of attacks, how might they affect the planning? Well, there's certainly a, a tremendous amount of political pressure throughout the alliance to, to do something and to help the Ukrainians and, uh, and make it all stop before, um, before um, the blood bill becomes too great. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, uh, the, the logistics of it are, are very straightforward, and that's happening now. The airlifting is going on. You, you mentioned it, in fact, before. Uh, so uh, that's continuing. The, um, I hesitate to say this, but uh, from, what, from what I can see, that uh, there, there comes a time when Zelensky and, uh, and his cabinet have to decide whether this is worth it. Now, I don't think we're there now. But sometime in the future, when the killing becomes um, even more widespread, uh, Zelensky has to look at, at whether this is, in fact, the best course of action for the Ukraine. Now, I know it's a terrible thing to say, to surrender, but uh, lives are in the balance, uh, and martyrdom always ends in death. So I wonder if uh, perhaps uh, that is probably not being uh, talked about right now in the Ukraine, but at some point in the future, uh, that'll have to be addressed, whether it is, in fact, worth it. Uh, look look at the map and look what the Russians are doing. They have almost completely uh, completed the encirclement of Kiev. The other major, many of the other major towns uh, are, are under shelling. Um, the noose is tightening, and it's tightening very quickly. And, and just how much of a blood a bloodbath uh, blood are, are the Allies permitted uh, or will permit? Because of course this makes for very bad news across across the alliance, so this is very much up for grabs. Now the reason I projected that in the future is that it just seems to me a, a one of one of the uh, decisions that may not be talked, maybe maybe is not being discussed now, but will be in the future, because the question is there: Is this all worth it? Is all of this emotion and all of this loss is it worth it? If it's going to continue and become even worse. I just put that out as a, uh, as, as a possible point of discussion. It looks like the Ukrainians are ready to, uh, uh, to, take the, to take the fight to the Russians, and the Russians are ready to increase bombardment. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's a situation that is going from very bad to very worse.